What must come first for you to unlock new growth opportunities at your financial brand? Is it digital transformation, adopting new technologies, or could it be human transformation? Well, let's find out together on today's episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. You're listening to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. Welcome back to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. I'm James Robert Lay, founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, where we help financial brands uncover and eliminate customer journey blind spots so that they stop losing loans and deposits. Now, before we get into today's episode with Danny, I want to invite you to be one of 100 financial brands that I will be guiding, that I will be coaching in 2025 through the Digital Growth Accelerator. But I want to be very clear. The 2025 Digital Growth Accelerator program is only, it is only for growth-minded financial brand marketing, sales, and leadership teams who want to thrive, not just survive, they want to thrive in 2025. So if you want to thrive in 2025, text me right now, 832-549-5792, and and let's just have a conversation. In fact, I've had some really good conversations with listeners of this podcast who have already texted me. We've already talked. They've already made a commitment to join the Accelerator because they want to learn. They want to grow together with their team. And I invite you to join them as well on that journey. Now, joining me for for today's conversation is Danny Varghese, president at Fortimize. And we're going to be talking about the intersection of, we'll say, digital transformation, some of the big opportunities that he is seeing through the work that he's been doing but also the role that human transformation plays to unlock digital transformation, which as a result then unlocks new areas for growth at your bank, at your credit union. Welcome to the show, Danny. It is so good to share time with you today, buddy. Likewise, James. Appreciate you having me on. Before we get into some of the trends, the patterns that you're observing through the work that you've been doing last year or so what what is going well for you to start the show off on a positive note give me a win personally professionally both for that matter what's been what's been good for you well personally i'm proud to say that my wife opened up her pediatric dental practice it's been a dream of hers since she was in high school she opened it up a few weeks ago so i am thrilled for her she works really hard uh, to serve the community and she has a focus on kids, especially kids with special needs. So I'm, I'm just really proud of her. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Congrats yeah. to you. Congrats to her on fulfilling this this dream that she's had since since high school. That's that's absolutely yeah. incredible. And to 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 be able to work from that place of purpose. I know you're working yeah. from a place of purpose as well. Your organization, Fortimize, you're you're, you're working from a place of purpose. What's driving the, the the why behind the work that you're doing today for yourself? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, our, our company was founded on the principle of for whom much is given, much is required. And our founder, John, and I share the same value system. We both believe in capitalism. We just wish it would be done differently in our country. And we believe in creating um, opportunities for people to grow, to learn, but also create wealth but we want that wealth to be shared and distributed amongst our entire team. And so why Fortimize was created, we we focus strictly in financial services. We are a professional services company, banks, credit unions, real estate, insurance companies. But our why is to serve our clients so that we could serve our people and, and our people can reap the benefits of that service and eventually their families, their communities. Uh, we firmly believe you have three things that we can give time, talent, and treasure. And if we can uh, create a place where our people can serve by giving their time, talent, treasure to our clients, and in return, we could do that for our communities, uh, what more can we ask for? It sounds very similar to the five dimensions of wealth and well-being that we believe here at the Digital Growth Institute, which, you know, a lot of times when you talk about wealth or well-being, the mind goes directly to financial wealth or to financial Mm -hmm. well-being and we are working in financial services both you and i however just i would say over the years my perspective has continued to shift to where there are really five levels there's five dimensions of wealth and well-being there is the spiritual level then there's the physical the mental 
the relational and, and, and then the financial, um, mm-hmm. but they're all interconnected. And I will tell you from personal experience, whenever I'm off kilter in one, it's like dominoes, the, they all start to kind of fall uh, with, with, within each other. So thinking about this place of, of purpose um, and why you're doing what you're doing, what have been the patterns, the trends that you've observed this year through the financial brands that you have guided and advised along their growth journeys? Yeah, and the trend has been continuing actually for the past few years. And I would say that this laser focused or dare I say obsession with the customer or the member, um, depending again, if you're a bank or a credit union, the challenge has been that uh, we've experienced clients in different parts of that journey in different maturity curves. Um, this year, specifically with the interest rates um, kind of climbing, we've seen many of our clients really focus on deposit account growth. And, and again, putting the customer or member at the center, we're, we're seeing our customers trying to figure out uh, how they acquire new customers or member. How do they cut costs internally through people and processes being more efficient, maybe using technology? How do they retain existing customers or members um, by knowing more about them? And then lastly, by not not only knowing more about them, but maybe even their relationships, the customer relationship, how do we how do we expand our offerings to to customers or members? So just just to put a fine point or an example on that is uh, we're seeing a lot of trends in marketing, to, again, to get that acquis- customer acquisition, but also creating an engagement la- layer, say, using something like Salesforce to understand the customer, the member, maybe their family members, what do they have in their uh, financial portfolio, and what other offerings uh, banks or credit unions can provide for them to help in their, like you said, financial well-being. So we've got acquisition, we've got retention, we've got expansion, and then we've got efficiencies. If we're going to take all of those points and distill them down, let's, let's, let's break each one of these open a little bit Mm -hmm. further or focus on a few, um, and, and, and dive even deeper. I, I want to start with acquisition. Um, and to your point, you're right. Deposits have been a thing this year and it's 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 funny with just the the cycles of time the cycles of the economy we'll see the pendulum swing back sooner or later to the 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 lending side of the house but for right now depository focus when it comes to acquisition what's the big challenge what's the big roadblock what's the big obstacle that has prevented growth in acquisition for financial brands this year and maybe even projecting that out into the into the coming year what do financial brands need to be aware of that could be an impediment to their acquisition growth yeah i would say i mean the big challenge we're seeing with our clients is just the ability to attract new clients or members and that demographic is changing and the demographic is changing to be more service oriented and technology forward so the ability to transact with the financial institution uh, with an iPad or a phone versus in branch is slowly shifting because of the demographic or the population. Now, I'm not saying in branch service is going away. No, Uh, but I am saying there is more of a shift towards electronic interaction, uh, but also just simple things like if I'm a new customer, how do I open a new account and or get onboarded efficiently without having to do a mountain of paperwork and having to go in a branch and frankly signing papers um, manually. Uh, That shift to be more digital centric is happening. Also, the other part is when when acquiring new customers, customers are just happy sometimes at the institution they have because there's a relationship there and also the institution knows them. And so the ability to restart a new relationship or maybe the fear of doing so is also preventing uh, new customer acquisition. It's interesting. You're talking about this idea of, you know, going into a branch um, without naming names. Uh, one of the things that we have found in a recent website secret shopping study uh, for a personal loan product. Uh, so it's it's not the depository side, but the behaviors, I would say, are the same. 
is we were exploring gaps or blind spots within that customer journey when it went from going from, say, the web shopping experience to Mm -hmm. the human experience. In this particular case, it was a a call-in. And the call to action on the phone was, well, just come on into the branch and we'll have that conversation. I'm curious as to where cultural alignment or more so cultural misalignment is creating impediments and gaps and blind spots within a customer journey. Because in this particular instance, this organization was looking to increase digital acquisition of the personal loan product. But whenever we were transitioning from the digital experience to the phone experience, we we had a lot of roadblocks that we had to overcome there to even get to talk to a person. But once we talked to a person, they were like, well, just come on in and we'll have that conversation. And at that particular point, if this was not a test, that would have created a drop off in potential conversion because there was un unnecessary or perhaps unexpected friction that that would have delayed or just completely derailed the account opening process altogether. Where does culture play into this? Because there's an internal perspective, yeah. there's an external perspective, and I think perspective is just how we see the world. And, and if we're all looking at things differently, it's very hard to get alignment. Yeah, great question. Uh, a couple things play into that. One, um, we live in such a digital world right now where everything is at our fingertips. Everything's expected to be done quickly. Um, the human attention span has now decreased to, I believe, the same time as, as um, the, the same time or same attention span of a goldfish. And so for us to uh, spend our attention trying to do tasks, now that has decreased. So something like uh, when you're in a loan process, the asking to come into a branch, I always say the number one thing that we don't have enough of that when we use, we never get back is time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from a culture perspective, we're in a place where we don't have a lot of time. If we have the time, we want to spend that doing other activities than other than opening up a a loan product. And then third, the attention span has gone down so dramatically that the time it takes to do tasks is now a, a friction point, as like you said. So three big challenges that will need to be solved in order for, again, to acquire new customers. It's interesting. The time, the energy, the attention, those are three points in the acronym that I uh, have in Banking on Change. Who's on your team? Um, How are you investing your time? What are you spending your energy on? What are you paying attention to? Because all three of those will directly help to answer the question, what's your relationship with money Uh, right there? So time, energy, attention, money. When it comes to time, because it is the great equalizer, where are there opportunities for financial brands, because you mentioned efficiencies within your opening perspective as a pattern, where are there opportunities to gain time back while at the same time deepening relationship with with people? Because, you know, behind every data point is a behind every one, behind every zero is, is, is DNA. It's, it's people, it's human beings, flesh and blood. People that have problems, questions, concerns, people that have hopes and dreams, but where is there an opportunity to gain efficiency when it comes to the, the human relationship? Yeah, there's quite a bit. I mean, I can, I can give you several examples from frontline managers to relationship managers to in branch um, uh, tellers to all the way back office and customer service. Uh, but I'll, let me just use the example you mentioned, which is loan product and tie it back to uh, one of the one thing I was talking about, I was proud of with my wife opening up a business. So uh, she, she opened her practice officially a couple of weeks ago, but she bought the commercial building about a year ago and had to do a build out. So uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, there weren't that many providers that, provides dental specific loans. And so we we narrowed it down and there were five uh, financial institutions that provided it. The experience across all five were vastly different. Um, not only from 
interest rates that they provide, but also experience. And so I'll, I'll give you the best example. When we were going through the qualification process, on one end of the spectrum, we had a bank ask us for all of our financials for the past three years, which we had to go, first of all, dig up. Right. Then we had to uh, find manual versus electronic uh, uh, a paper. For the paper ones, we had to scan them in. And then we had to, well, because of the size and the number, they would have to send us secure emails and we would have to respond to each secure email and put an attachment to it. And I will tell you, I spent hours just doing documents so that I can understand what interest rate we'll get. On the, the other side of the spectrum, we had one provider, which I loved. Um, they provide us a hyperlink, which we clicked on the link filled in our information. And from that, they actually gathered a lot of our background and personal information. And then when we had to upload the documents, it was one page where I literally dragged and dropped and it did uh, OCR or optical character recognition to just confirm, yep, it's the right document. And it had very visual indicators and it gave a step-by-step -step process of where we were. And that took me 30 minutes. Mm. Um, and so hours versus 30 minutes um, obviously, from an experience perspective, I greatly enjoyed working with that other lender. Now, at the end of the day, transparently, we did not go with that lender because the interest rates were several percentage points different. Uh, but regardless, I I think about that experience all the time. And and that's an interesting point because the experience it hurt less. Um, it was easier. It was more. Uh, frictionless uh, but but you didn't go with them because at the end of the day it came down to price and price sensitivity um yep. and and i guess that's where it's it's looking at the intersection you know one of the things that we're looking at from a research perspective is is where speed does play um in regards to decision making jay bear has done a lot of research on this to where speed and trust are now synonymous and a lot of that is being driven from external experiences, i.e. Amazon Prime. Um, Prime mm. has set an expectation. We click, we get. Um, and sometimes same day now, um, sometimes within hours, depending upon the product and your lo location. Um, so those are all setting expectations that will directly influence one's perception of the experience that they have with us on the opposite end of the, the equation is what you're talking about. And I've gone through that same exact experience applying for an SBA loan um, over the years. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it seemed like hours. And at one point I'm like, is this even worth it? Like I was really questioning <laughs> life for that matter. Yeah. Cause it was just like, it's gotta be a better way um, to, to help People. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the conversation with Danny, but I wanted to take a quick minute to tell you about the 2025 Digital Growth Accelerator program that we have launched exclusively, exclusively for growth-minded financial brand marketing sales and leadership teams who want to thrive and not just survive in 2025. So if this sounds like you, text me right now, 832-549-5792. That's because when you join the 2025 Digital Growth Accelerator program, you and your team are going to get a few things that will truly help you level up your loan and deposit growth. Number one, you're going to get a customer journey assessment and website secret shopping study that shows you exactly where you have blind spots in your customer journey right now that are costing you millions of loans and deposits. Second, you're gonna get access, unlimited access for your team, for your organization, marketing, sales, leadership. You're gonna get alignment with all 12 classes in the Digital Growth University so that together, you can learn together, you can grow together, you can confidently develop a strategy that provides a clear path forward for you to unlock new levels of growth. And finally, you're gonna get ongoing learning and development through quarterly customer journey masterclass workshops where I'm going to teach you, where I'm going to show you exactly what you need to do next to eliminate common customer journey blind spots that we have seen over the last 10 years and yes they still exist for many financial brands and i'm going to show you where you can eliminate these blind spots so that you can level up your loan and deposit growth every 90 days even better you can join the accelerator 100 risk free what does that mean it means that you can have your money back that 
if by the end of 2025, you don't gain at least a dozen new ideas that are going to help you build your brand while at the same time eliminating customer journey blind spots, you're going to get your money back. Because I understand how financial brands, or let's just say they're averse to risk. They're risk averse. So put another way, question, what are you risking? What are you risking right now by not joining the Digital Growth Accelerator? How many more loans and deposits are you going to risk losing because you probably do have unseen gaps? You probably do have blind spots in your customer journeys right now that you're just simply not aware of. And, th and that's okay. What's not okay is to not do anything about it. So here's the best part. When you take action to apply what you learn in the Digital Growth Accelerator, you're going to make your investment back. The investment that you're making in yourself, the investment that you're making in your team, when you acquire just three to five new accounts. So if you're ready to thrive and not just survive in 2025, text me right now, 832-549-5792, and let's have a quick conversation. And with that, let's get back to the conversation with Danny. And speaking of that better way, where, where do you see the biggest opportunity for financial brands You know, looking out over the next 12, 18 months, 24 months, short horizon line here? when it comes to either acquisition, retention, expansion, um, or, or really efficiency, what, what, what's the big opportunity? Get to know your customers and members better, even more than you do today. And it goes back to your earlier question of how do these experiences deepen the relationships? Um, let me use a different analogy and then tie it back to um, financial institutions. I had a, um, a, a car and um, I'm, I'm a car guy. And when I, when I used to have this car, I drove it into the dealership. And when I drove in, they had technology that scanned my VIN. And then my name and a, a, a little profile popped up on the TV screen when I walked in. The service rep that I always worked with came out, opened the door for me, asked me how I'm doing, knew about my wife and kids, knew their ages, knew the activities that I last talked to them about, asked about those things. Then when I walked into the dealership or and talked to him about service, he knew my buyer values. He knew that I didn't care so much about price. I cared more about value. And so when we talked about things we needed to do with my car, he always made sure that he recommended things that were of the highest value mm -hmm. for the price. And I, I, his name is Greg Weems. And I haven't worked with him in over seven years. And I still remember his name. And so now relate that to a relationship, a financial institution, whether you are um, on the personal or retail side or commercial, I do think they're equally important to really know your customer member, what stage they are in life, what type of needs do they need to be financially healthy? And if they have a family, what do their families need? Do they have kids? Are their kids going to college? Do they need financial vehicles to save up for them? Do they need to help build credit history for their kids so that when the kids get out, right? How do we help people retire? Those types of questions is, um, I, I think financial brands really need to understand how do we surround a client or member and offer them the best service to impact their financial well-being. And it goes back to what we do in consulting, right? When our clients are happy, it actually impacts our bottom line directly. And I think that's the same for financial institutions. It's interesting, and I appreciate your story. It's, it's reminding me of an experience. So my wife, she wanted to, she had these dreams. You talk about your wife opening up this pediatric dental uh, facility. My wife, since she was little, she wanted to fly on the Concorde. She wanted to stay at the Plaza Hotel. <laughs> and uh, Concorde was no longer flying, but staying at the Plaza Hotel was something that you know, we could make that dream a reality because I was speaking at an event. This was years ago. This was before we had kids. And um, speaking at an event in New Jersey, I said, hey, why don't you come to me? And we'll, we'll, we'll go to New York. We'll go to Manhattan afterwards. So we got a car. We went up to Manhattan and uh, we're there. And she thought we were going to stay at the Marriott. And so we pull up to the to the plaza and she was like, what's this? And I was like, we're here. And she was like, she didn't want to get out of the car. She, she was like, she thought it was like too good to be true. And uh, so we get out and she, someone's helping her with her bags and someone comes up to me and they're like, well, welcome to the plaza, Mr. Lay. And I was like, 
how do they know my name? How do they know my name? It's so funny though. It's it's so low tech. What it was is they just simply ask the question, what's your name? Had a conversation, relayed that through the headset to the, the gentleman who was helping me, but it was so quote unquote personalized because names are important. And I think your experience and my experience, there's a pattern here that, that translates back into financial services, which is, it all comes down to a conversation. That conversation is going to unlock new insight, new data, if you will. What we do with that, where we store that, how we recall that for the next experience, to me, it sounds like that's where the big opportunity is. My question to you, though, what prevents an, an institution, a bank, a credit union, and I don't even want to stay on the technology piece of this right now, because yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's good old what we're doing here. It's People. a good old conversation. And, and, and what I'm observing is perhaps that's a skill that has been lost over the years that can be further developed and not just developed, but really amplified and multiplied in conjunction with technology, like some of the work that you're doing with CRM and Salesforce. But what, what's, the, what's the impediment to the conversation to begin with, because you could have the technology, but if you don't have the conversation or even know how to have the conversation, yeah. where's the value creation? And yeah, there's a, the, there's the old adage, which has been now refined to people process technology and now data. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with the people and I, and an impediment for financial institutions is there are legacy institutions with that folks that have been there for, 20 plus years that have done the same thing over and over, which has been successful. And I don't want to take that away. But to our earlier conversation, there is a change in culture, a change in demographic and change in expectations. And with that, people have to change. And when people change, they have to also talk about how do we change processes? And frankly, technology is the only the enabler. I, I have no problem saying, and this is what I do all day, every day. But technology is worthless without the people in the process to support it. And then the last thing is, and this is the new uh, last couple of years, I would say, is you take all that, what type of data and insights can you capture? And then what are you going to do with that data? Um, take action upon it. So that's the impediment, James, is really just it takes courage. It takes commitment. You mentioned in your book, Making and Change, like be committed to something and it does. I, I remember I was working with um, a CIO of an insurance company and I, I just, I loved working with him and it was over a multi-year digital transformation journey and it was a, by all accounts a success. But I remember there were a lot of challenges through that journey and he would come and tell me, Hey, listen, we are not giving up. We are going to make this happen. We are going to win. And his favorite line is the train is heading north. Some people are going to stay on. Some people aren't, but it's up to those folks who want to reach the destination to jump on and, and hold on tight. And I loved when he would say that because he was the change agent. The train is heading north and some people are going to jump on. Some people are going to get off. Yep. Some people are going to get on because they know that the train yes. is, is going somewhere. Yes. What What you're digging into here is the human experience and the human experience has two sides. There's the employee experience and then there's the member or the customer experience. The human experience is the bridge. The technology back to your point is the enabler or the multiplier. When it comes to human experience and navigating the complexity of change, nav navigating the complexity of transformation, what have you seen that has been most helpful for organizations to chart that course, take the first step, ha increase the level of courage to commit to move forward with confidence. Where does it all begin? I do think it begins with leadership. Um, these are a little bit of old change management principles. Um, I believe it starts from the top. Someone or a group of leaders have to be champions about it. It comes with constant communication and creating clarity of communication. 
um, and constantly saying, this is where we're going, but also why. Uh, a big fo- big reason why people do not uh, change or accept change is there's either too much done at once or they, they're not clear what's in it for them mm-hmm. or where we're going. And so um, we see the most successful organizations from the top saying, this is where we're going and constantly communicating that. This is why we're doing it. This is what's in it for you. And the last thing that I think gets overlooked is start small. I mean, when we think about anything we do in life, whether it be trying to work out and get back to the gym or eating healthy, if we do it all at once, we're more likely to fall off. But if we talk about, like in the book of Atomic Habits, small small changes. So just start small. Start with a business line, whether it be customer service or relationship banking, something small. And let's say, let's figure out how we track lead and referrals, or let's figure out how we figure out with our call center, what are the number top 10 reasons why people are calling in? Let's go solve that one thing and then go from there. That idea of starting small, it's so relevant to, like you said, physical health and well-being, really just starting anything new for that matter, because when you're at the starting line, take running a marathon. It's like you don't go out and wake up one day and think, oh, I'm going to go run 26.2. No, it's like couch to 5K or like, let me just walk the block and get my legs back underneath me. And then that one lap becomes a second and then a third and then a fourth. And oh, before you know it, it's three miles, five miles, 10 miles, half marathon. And then there you go. Race day, you know, six months later, eight months later. And it's like, we did the whole thing. But I think confidence though, it's critically important here, particularly at the leadership level. Confidence is the result of doing what you say you're going to do. It's say, this is what we're going to do this is why we're doing it. And then being able to measure and back and, and, and look at the progress that we've made over the last three months, six months, nine months. Cause that's what creates the distance into where we begin. And, and I know with initiatives like technology, they can feel like a slog to begin to even get started. But it's like, if we look back three months and like, this is where we were, this is where we're at now, that's progress. We're not there yet, but at least we've, the train has moved to the North. Yeah. And I I have one of my favorite sayings someone told me is um, it takes discipline. Mm -hmm. And if you're disciplined enough to do the same things over and over, that becomes a desire. And you do that often enough, the desire becomes delight. And that, that is with any habit, that's with any process, and that's also with digital transformation. Discipline? Discipline becomes desire. See, discipline is yeah. what differentiates the dreamers and the doers. Um, yes. And, and, and a lot of times when you do start something new, it is hard. And it's hard because it's foreign. Yeah. It's, it's different. It's uncomfortable. Um, but one of the things that I've been continuously working with my kids is, Let's be disciplined to do difficult things. Let's be disciplined to do hard things that make us feel uncomfortable. And I think by starting my kids at a young age, it's my hope that as they continue to grow and mature, what was your, what was your three paths here? Discipline. Yeah. Discipline creates desire, Desire. which then creates delight. Delight because it's what was painful actually becomes delightful. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Okay. So here, let, let's, let's continue yeah. down this path. Cause one of the things that I always encourage financial brand leaders is like this idea of adaptability, AQ, EQ plus AQ is greater than IQ, particularly now in the age of AI. So emotional intelligence with adaptability quotient, both of them can be measured. Both of them can be benchmarked. Both of them can be coached and increased. Now, one of the things that I always encourage financial brand leaders, particularly when doing a workshop or I'm speaking at an event, like, listen, do you, do you want to increase your AQ? Do you want to increase your adaptability quotient? Like right now, tonight, when you go back to your room, they're like, yes, tell me what I need to do. And I'm like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make you promise because I think that's this just going a little too far, but I'm going to really encourage you to do this. Are you going to be committed? I said, yes. And then I say, it's so simple. 
You will increase your adaptability quotient when you go back to your room and you take a cold shower. Mm-hmm. And I'm dead serious. And 90% of people will look at me, they'll moan, they'll complain, <laughs> they'll gripe. Like, I'm never going to take a cold shower. I, that's just, that's too painful. And then I'm like, discipline discipline to do hard things and then i tell them i'm like listen i I could not stand in front of this room and and invite you to do something that i haven't done for myself i said i bought a cold plunge specifically for this reason like i i I started cold plunging in my bathtub with just water bottles I'm in Houston. I know you're, you're in Chicago. So it's, you know, it gets hot down here. So it's very hard to, you know, get cold water coming out of the faucet in the summer months. So I get these big old bottles and freeze them and throw them in the bathtub. There's too much friction there. I I found it became too easy to like, ah, I'm not going to fill the water bottles. And then I just bit the bullet and I was like, cause I was disciplined to this practice in my life. So I went and bought a cold plunge with a chiller to where literally keeps the water at 39 degrees. So all I do every single morning is I wake up, I do Wim Hof breathing, I go jump in the cold plunge. Two minutes, two minutes and 15, two minutes and 30 seconds. Time myself on my watch. It has not gotten easier. It's painful. Like, but the feeling that I get when it's done to have that much of a win that early in the morning, the days that I do it are like 10 out of 10. The days I don't do it, maybe seven, maybe a six. So I've been observing this now over the course of about 18 months. So what's your take on that? Like, this has nothing to do with financial services, but it has everything to do with the human experience, change, transformation. Because then we just add the context of technology as a layer of behavior modification. What's your take on being disciplined to do difficult things? And, and maybe where in your life have you been disciplined to do difficult things yourself? Yeah, uh, you know, I, you actually mentioned this in the, your book, and I loved it, how uh, the adaptability in doing different things creates resilience. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I love, um, I love when I get asked the question, what's, what are some of the common traits of the best leaders you've ever worked with or come across? Uh, it's intense curiosity, but it's also grit the ability to or have gone through tough times and create resilience from that. Uh, Because look, not just leadership, but business is hard. It's not easy. And anything worth doing is never going to be easy. And you're going to go through tough times and challenging times. But the key is, how do you get over that quickly? And you also mentioned this book, how do you see those difficult times as opportunities versus impediments or blockers? And so kind of just having that mindset um, you, know, you know, just sharing personally, I had an opportunity uh, midway through high school to go to India for two years. And I actually lived there, uh, finished out my high school there thinking I was going to do a completely different profession. But that completely changed my worldview and perspective. Because when you talked about cold showers, there was no hot water in the dorms there. So every day was a cold shower. Uh, we didn't have laundry machines. So we actually uh, cleaned our clothes outside on a rock. Uh, food. We're fortunate to have three meals a day, but I, my family wasn't well off. So I actually experienced for the first time having to ration food. Um, it was just, and, and I lived on a farm, a real farm, a true farm with no machines. So I helped my grandmother out during the summers, uh, helping pick the rice patty, uh, pick the um, rice out of the patties. And so just that experience opened me up to, first of all, we are absolutely fortunate to be in this country. I mean, we have so many things that other people don't. And it's not a good or bad thing. It just created a heart of gratitude. But the second was um, it it created some resilience in me. I realized I was spoiled. um, But I also realized um, the the true meaning of real hard work, not not just white collar, but real blue collar work. And uh, it was difficult. I mean, you know, going to a place that it was extremely hot a third world country. I actually got to see and experience real poverty. Uh, it puts things into perspective. And when you go through those tough things, you come back here and it's like, hey, uh, 
a project is red or um, someone's unhappy, uh, those are small challenges compared to what we've experienced in the past. See, and and you sh- and thank you so much for sharing that because I think that perspective is what creates context into the macro, like your macro experience and those macro experiences will then impact just your perspective, even down to the micro. Like you said, if a project isn't red, like let's put this into perspective here. Um, And you mentioned though, being curious. And as we start to wrap up, I want to, I want to end on this point because when it comes to unlocking growth, whether that's acquisition, retention, expansion, or efficiency. There's always going to be something new to learn. The challenge that I see, and this comes from the research that we did writing Banking on Change, and even now, you know, it's it's been out for six to eight months. And I'm hearing this even more so. It's like, James Robert, I'm so busy. Like, I don't have time to really learn. I'm just stuck doing what I've always done. Mm. I'm empathetic, but at the same time, I'm like, these are your choices. What, what are you prioritizing? Yeah. Cause it's, you know, 70 to 80% of, of financial brand leaders are investing one to two hours a week or less into their ongoing learning and development. And it's like, as we see the world continuing to change at an exponential rate, the only way to change is to truly see something from a different perspective. And you're speaking from life experience here. That can come from reading a book. That can come from listening to a podcast. It can come from watching a video. It can come from reading an article, it can come from just life experience and connecting dots that are completely what at the surface would seem to be irrelevant. But you're like, huh, let me draw a connection from this and let me draw a connection from that. But to do that, you have to create space and time to learn and then to think. For someone who is watching or listening, they probably are invested in their ongoing learning and development, but they're probably working with people who are not. So this question is to help those who are invested in their learning development, working with people who are not, how, how can they help empower them? How can they inspire them to create that space and time to connect back to curiosity, to look at the world through the lens of a five-year-old and, and say, you know what? Mm. I don't know it all. And that's okay, because I do think ego gets in the way, particularly at the leadership levels. Like, there are some leaders who are like are scared to admit that I have no idea what's going on with this whole AI thing, and that's okay. Because guess what? Yeah, I don't know either. I'm still learning, and and will probably have to continue to learn because there's going to be something else that comes and something else that comes. So then I have to continuously go back to zero what would you recommend and maybe what have you done for yourself to continuously stay curious and to continue to learn and to change a perspective, even change an opinion? Yeah, James, I love this question. Uh, I think a lot of the curiosity comes with deep self-awareness and a lot of the decisions we make or actions we don't take are rooted in fear. And fear can be a powerful motivator. The, the 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 fear that I have that motivates me is there's the adage of, you know, you're so busy chopping wood, you forget to sharpen your axe. Mm. And so when we're afraid, when we're uncomfortable, the human tendency is to go back, fall back into what we're comfortable doing. And so as a leader, we can't be doing all the time. We have to be leading. And that does mean you have to take timeouts to sharpen your axe. What does that mean? If you have an eight hour day, I would recommend instead of one to two hours a week spending um, on personal development, make it half hour a day. And it's as simple as just blocking your calendar. And like you said, reading an article, uh, reading some, picking up a book, even in your own time, I would encourage folks to do that 
one of the greatest ways I get to learn is I just talk to people, have a conversation. I go to people much smarter than me and I just pick their brain. Um, what are you seeing in AI? My brother is actually uh, deep in AI right now. And I talk to him all the time and I ask him questions about, hey, what what are you seeing? Uh, and I can't tell you where he works, but I ask him, uh, what is what is he seeing? How are they applying AI? What are some of the pitfalls? What do folks like us have to know? You know, just constantly asking questions uh, because my fear is not having a sharp ax. And I know some folks, it's really just understanding what their fears are uh, and then having self-awareness to say, how do you overcome that? It, it's it's th that, that would be my personal advice. That's fantastic. And I really appreciate the perspective. As, as we wrap up here, I always like to send off those watching or listening with an action that they can take right now. It, it doesn't have to be big. It can preferably, it's something small that they can do next to move forward and make progress on their journeys of growth, um, regardless of where they're at. Some are probably going to be further along than others, and that's okay. Um, we're all on, on a journey, and if we can measure the progress that we make, then we're all going to be better off tomorrow than, than we are today. So, Danny, what would be the, the one thing that you would recommend one watching or listening to do right now that can ensure they make progress? Take 30 minutes a day. Just block it on your calendar. Uh, maybe it's during lunch. Maybe it's the first thing you get up. Maybe it's how you close your day. 30 minutes a day and just read. And uh, read maybe on a topic that, that you don't know anything about. Read on a topic that you're passionate about. Uh, read on something that uh, may, maybe you want to learn more. Whatever it is, just 30 minutes a day, read. And if you can create that discipline, I promise you that'll create a delight mm. and eventually that will become a desire. I really appreciate that. And I'm going to add to that 25 minutes of reading, five minutes of reflection and writing to think mm. through what you just learned, because it's through the thinking, it's through the writing that you're able to distill that down. And there's a framework that I share in banking on change, which is exponential ideas is the exponential ideas framework and ideas is an acronym so take that 25 minutes to read and then take literally five minutes ideas what are the top three insights it's an acronym insights what are the top three insights that you gained d decide on the on the number one that you think would create the greatest value for your team for yourself for your organization uh, so that's that's insights then decide on the number one uh, expand upon that uh, which is the E in ideas, expand upon why, why is this important and why now? Then give it an A, give it an action. It's like, what's, what can I do to apply this, to take some action on what I just learned on that number one thing that I've distilled down out of three? And then finally, the S of ideas is to share this. Who do I need to share this with? Whether to help elevate their perspective or to gain some accountability to ensure that I actually take action. Do that, like you said, for f every day, five days, put it on your calendar. And I guarantee you at the end of 90 days, you're going to be a completely different person. There's, it's just impossible. Like you, you will never be the same because you're always going to be seeing and thinking about something different than what you were the day before. Yeah. Danny, this has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate just going down this path together here. If someone wants to continue the conversation, walk the path of growth together with you, What's the best way for them to reach out and say hello? LinkedIn connection. Uh, send me a connection and more often than not, accept it. Connect with Danny. Learn with Danny, grow with Danny. Danny, thanks so much for joining for another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. This has been a lot of fun today. Likewise. Thank you, James. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm humbled. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, be the light.